Boom. Okay. Input's good. All right. So thank you to everyone who's joining uh, today. Uh, we're going to be talking about losses. And losses is a really important thing to talk about because I think we all have our own impressions of what we're supposed to be doing. Should We should never be taking losses. The only I've even said, you know, the only way you lose money is if you sell for a loss. Um, and that's true, right? I mean, at this point, I mean, now granted, if everything goes down and you don't have the option of selling for a profit or breaking even, then that's a de facto decision made for you. But there are also other times that you want to consider taking losses um, because there are other factors at play. Um, you know, a lot of this also has to do with when, what your goals are, why you're in this, how quickly you plan on taking money out, um, how much gains you're trying to realize, what specific positions you're in and why, you know, one that comes to mind, we'll look at the chain is the master nodes. That's a big factor for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different things at play, um, when we're looking at our portfolio and when we should be moving, why we are moving and, you know, when it's maybe okay to actually take losses. So I'm going to give some specific case examples, um, over the past few weeks, uh, in my own portfolio. And I, you know, I, I, this conversation or this, uh, talk evolved out of a lot of people talking about in this server, you know, I have, I bought into this or, you know, I'm waiting for it to break even, or, you know, I have some profits, but I'm not sure I think it can go up more. And a really important factor is to figure out, much like when you're buying into the market with fiat, you may be debating whether to get Ether <clears throat> at a specific price. And if you're buying a tremendous amount, like a large, large amount, it is certainly advantageous to get a very good price overall on it. But if you're buying, let's say, a modest amount, and we'll define modest as somewhere you know under $10,000 worth, um, you don't necessarily have to obsess about your entry price if it's maybe a $50 range with Ether or you know uh, a couple, a few hundred dollars in Bitcoin. Of course, you want to get the best price, enter you know at the most optimal point. If you have technical analysis that can give you some signals on that, do that. The reason I say why it's not the most important thing is maybe that $500, maybe those couple of thousand dollars have a tremendous impact right then. But if you're going to ultimately be putting them into something that over the next few months or weeks or days is going to go up by 50%, 100%, 200 300%, does it really matter if you get the absolute best price on your entry level? So this same type of principle applies when we're looking at losses too. So I'm going to give the first example, and I mentioned this in the server over the past few weeks. There were two things that I exited out that I had um, small positions to a decent position in, and both had, you know, I liked in my portfolio. So the first one was GVT, Genesis Vision. I spoke about it briefly. It made my January hold list. What did I do? I sold it. Whoa, I'm breaking my own advice seemingly, why did I sell it? Uh, first, let's talk about if you have GVT um, and you don't have anything else you want to move into right now, it's a great coin to hold. I think that we're looking at around, you know, anywhere between 15 and $30 on that. You, know, you could be looking at a $100 coin when the project actually begins to launch um, after March of this year. It's a very interesting, cool thing. But this isn't the Genesis Vision talk. Why did I sell it at a loss? Where did I buy it? Let's talk about that. I bought the majority of my GVT is split between the price range of 13,000 Satoshis and 24,000 Satoshis. So 13,000 Satoshis was a really good entry point, and I got a, you know about 30% of my overall uh, percentage of GVT in that range. But then I started buying all the way up to 24. And unfortunately, I didn't buy the smallest amount at 24. I bought another 40%. Um, up at 24,000. So if we're looking at GVT right now on Binance, it's at 16,000. I ended up selling the majority of my GVT at an average of around where it is right now. So I don't feel too bad about it. Um, but that was a loss, right? The, that 24,000 Satoshi GVT was a, a few thousand dollars. It was not a small amount of money to be taking a loss on. So why did I do that? Well, first of all, I looked at it go down for a little bit and, you know, watch my money and my potential uh, profits and, you know, losses and lo profits reduce and losses increase. 
Um, so I probably watched it for a little bit too long. I do like it as a long-term project, but I recognize that relative to Bitcoin, as it was going down, um, GVT was not gaining on Bitcoin. It was kind of going and dumping along with Bitcoin. People were dumping it. There wasn't a tremendous amount of volume. They wanted to move into Bitcoin or Tether, something that felt safer to them than staying in GVT. So I watched that for a couple of days and eventually took a big loss on it. So the reason I took a big loss on it uh, is I moved into Venn. So at that point, Venn was, I believe, still in the 40s. I'd have to check my order history. And I was quite confident at this point, given all of the signs, the price, where it was at in dollars, that this was a much had a much greater chance of going up than GVT did to make you know my money back. So whether I was looking for a profit or just a big breathe in on my GVT losses, I felt then was the better play. So that's what I did. I took what amounted to, I think, between a 30 and 40% loss on GVT, moved it into Venn um, in the 40,000 range. And now, even in today's dipping, that's 20,000 more than where it was uh, you know, before when I moved it in. So I made all my GVD profits back um, and then some. So that was an example of I knew or felt that I knew that the dynamics were in place, that this loss was actually not going to hurt me as much as just leaving in there and stewing over that I'm holding a bag of GVT. So the second time I did this, and this one is even a little crazier if you really think about it, but I took marketplace dynamics again into play. So you know that I've been talking about SALT and the ad, um, advantages it provides in terms of cashing out, in terms of arbitrage, in terms of just the quality coin to hold on to for a year, if that's what you're looking to do. Um, so the main thing is I every SALT that I bought was is going to be at worst value twice as much as I bought it for and at best over three times because of the arbitrage is the internal loan mechanism that SALT has. So when I sold what amounted to about ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 worth of SALT, that was really like, if I play, just used it for a loan, like three times as much, somewhere in like the twenty-five dollars to $30,000 range. So that was a big decision that I needed to make. Um, and the truth is, I sold all of my salt by accident. Everyone makes mistakes. I put 100% in, sold it all at a price, immediately freaked out, didn't know what I did, watched the price go down so I could have bought a little bit more and gotten out of my mistake. But I decided, you know what? This is probably not going to go up that much. Is there anything right now I can put it in that I think reliably is going to go up? Of course, my old trusty friend, VE Chain, uh, was something that I put it in. Just to be clear, that right now, as we're speaking, when VE chain is 63,500 Satoshis, which I think is a good buy right now, um, is lower. I still have a loss on that. So we'll see how that pans out. But right now, that is a decision that wouldn't couldn't be considered an overwhelming win. I've actually taken a further loss on what I cashed out of SALT for. Now, why did I do this with SALT? Why did I potentially take a loss on something that's even three times the value in dollars than you know, just sitting in it and just letting it happen and seeing what happens with VE chain. One is I was very bullish on VE chain. Two is I'm waiting for a loan from Salt. Until I get the application for the loan, I can't really do anything with that Salt. So I've been looking at it for a month and I really like it. And if I had the patience to hold it for a year, I think that would be wonderful and I'd probably be in great shape. But I also want it to be an active part of my portfolio. So the reason I moved it is as soon as my loan application comes in, I'm banking on SALT still having an arbitrage possibility. So the gains that I've realized that are either sitting in Bitcoin, um, the 10% I allocate for trading on a daily basis, or my VEN that I could potentially sell some of it, um, I am wagering that I will be able to buy the SALT back to pay off the terms of the loan and still be able to do the arbitrage. That's my theory. It could go totally sideways. It could go, it could mess, get messed up, right? Salt could shoot up. My loan could come in. I could say, nope, I can't take this loan because I can't buy it back. It doesn't make any sense for me. And I would not have to take the loan and I, you know, figure it out. I'm also okay with that scenario because, as many of you know, I'm relatively bullish still over the next month on VE chain, you know, looking between 50 and 100% gains, I think, before <clears throat> the rebranding event happens. So, again, <clears throat> these are situations, one that's already worked out GVT, SALT, one that may or may not work out. I believe that it will, but I'm confident with taking those losses. The main thing you want to be able to determine and get yourself to the point where you can do it is, do you know why you would be taking a loss? 
Is it okay to take that loss? Is it really going to hurt you in the long run? Are you emotionally attached? This is something I have to ask about with Ven all the time. Here's the, the, the truth about Ven. If I wasn't emotionally attached or attached to it in any way, the right decision would be is the stack that I have that's over the strength node that I can realistically move around. Whenever it hits you know, the top of a trend line that someone's doing technical analysis with or just a clear apex, I should probably sell some of that. Not even necessarily to buy something else, but for when it inevitably goes down a little bit, buy more. But I'm attached to it. I'd rather not take those risks. Like a lot of people in this server, we've moved our van around and seen it go up well beyond our reach. And we try to back, buy back in. It's We can get a lot less. You know, those things tend to have psychological imprints on us. It's not the worst thing in the world. But the main point of this is there are absolutely times you should be taking losses to move into something else. The trick is, is to be able to identify those areas and situations and also just be comfortable knowing that even if you take a loss, if relative to your other gains or your potential move, it's not the worst thing in the world. Sometimes you got to take an L, right? That's just like the way of the world. If you're in a street fight with someone, I don't know why I'm using this sample. I've never been in a street fight. But if you're in a street fight with someone and you're com coming with a knife and they have a gun, yeah, you can go into that battle and hold it on. You don't want to take that loss, but you're probably going to get shot and die. So maybe just, you know, walk away, take the L that day, you know, and come live to fight another day. It's a pretty extreme example. But my point is, is there are absolutely times where you don't want to just go, I'm holding on to this because I'm down no matter what, and then see something you actually thought was going to do well, do well, and you're still stuck in the thing because you have some attachment to it. So that's my basic uh, spiel about taking losses. I've found that initially I was very reluctant to take any type of loss and it certainly led to me missing out on some things and also led to just, you know, nothing happening with the things I was holding on to. The point I was able to confidently take losses and not really like obsess about it or freak out about it and even if it went up or whatever it was, things got a lot easier for me psychologically and I think that's basically what we're getting at here is how do we operate within the market? How are we in tune with it? So even if things maybe don't go perfectly or is it exactly how we envisioned, how are we still able to you know do well within this sphere? Okay, so that's my little spiel. If there are any questions about any of this specifically or generally, put them in the voice chat text channel um, and you can ask them in there. Otherwise, that's it pretty short talk today and this uh, the questions also don't have to be about um losses in particular they can be though question about something else yeah go ahead drin drin then market cap change okay yeah so we were talking about this earlier um so basically this is there's a lot of things happening right now and continue to ask the question as you write it all I'll, I'll look into it but the market cap changed significantly on coin market cap for people who had been paying attention, this was an anticipated change. Uh, people knew that the numbers they had for the circulating supply were incorrect. It was about 200 or 250 million less than it should have been. So the market cap, um, when they added those increased in the circulating supply, uh, shot up significantly, basically a billion dollars. So we've been talking about it um, in this server. What does that mean for the price of VEN? Well, there's a lot of ways to look at this. You have to understand that Venn has gone up so much in the past month. I mean, a month ago, it was still like just over a dollar. Before that, it was under a dollar. So, I mean, we're looking at huge gains. So there are people who are just regular non-long-term holders who have money in. They want to get out. There are also a lot of new people who have got in maybe in the 30s, 40s, 50s in Satoshis. who are like, you know what? I'm happy with these gains. Now, all of a sudden, this market cap changes. It's now, instead of a top 20 coin, it's a top 15 coin. Do I really think this is that much more room to grow relative to maybe something outside of the top 100 so I could get bigger gains there? So, yeah, I think that's what we're seeing. Also, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but the whales were actively suppressing even when the price went over $9. Like, the sell walls were there. There's a screenshot in the server of when they threw up a $6.8 million sell wall. That did not get eaten through all the way. They pulled it. So they're still in these waters. I, From what I'm seeing, as I imagine, it's quite a bit of small accumulation up and down as this price gets pressed. And also, I think they're coming in and pushing it down a little bit. I think you're going to see these four or five Bitcoin walls pop up. Nothing huge relative to what's been there. 
but to put a little fear in people that, hey, I shouldn't buy into this. It's not really going to go up. You know, the way we'll see if this is actually the case, and I'm not just talking out of my ass, is if at a certain point this gets to a price where collectively the people with a lot of money are like, no, this is too good to be true. There's no way. So basically what this means is is we're trying to find entry points. You know, It's okay if you buy it. Like right now it's below the price that I recommended buying at it today, which is a buy signal. I would be buy. I actually, hold on. I actually literally, just to show that I'm not talking out of my ass, I bought Litecoin, <laughs> transferred it over to Binance, and I'm literally, while we're doing this call, I'm going to get some then because it is at a price that I deem to be appropriate, even if it goes down, right? Even if it goes down significantly, it's still at a price that I think is really good. So now I have Bitcoin and now I'm not going to buy it on the phone because that would just be reckless. But, you know, it's at a price that I think is a good price. Um, And I do think whales are actively suppressing it. I think they're taking advantage of what looks to be a regular consolidation correction, the reason I say looks to be is this chart is artificial. It continues to be artificial. And I, that doesn't mean it's not going to react and be like a normal um, a normal chart. It's just that the price should be higher than it is now already. The reason it's not is we've seen the type of price suppression we're on it. Long term, all this means is if you're accumulating, there's a lot of good buy zones here. Don't feel bad if you have a high price and you're watching it go down. Um, You certainly can try to catch falling knives. So sell and buy when something is falling. That's not the worst thing to do. Um, But really, if if you're in VE chain at this point because of this server, you're probably not in it just for short gains. And if you are... There are probably a lot better coins to be in, truthfully. Like VeChain is not going to move the way you want it to move. But if you're in VeChain because you believe in the tech, you believe in the model, you believe in the partnerships, you believe in the company in general, you know, I, the only two things you should be doing right now are either if it's bothering you because your money is going down, step away, or trying to figure out, you know, what you realistically you can put in to get more. Um, that's it, because like I, I, I in no way there would. Ha- it would have to be such a dramatic fall or some major catastrophe with their rollout or rebrand that would shake my confidence in what's going on. DNVGL um, had their press conference. Sonny Liu was there. Um, they basically flat out said they're going to be investing in the blockchain as the focal point of their company, um, which means that all of their clients are going to basically being integrated into VE chain if they want to use blockchain technology. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I think if you follow the tea leaves and read the tea leaves here that you would be excited about being V chain, especially at these prices, um, right around $7 or under, I love. Um, and a good way to think about the price of V chain in dollars is think how much a master node costs. When a couple of weeks ago it got pushed down to $3 and 30 cents, that was $33,000 for a master node. Today, when we're talking about price suppression, you know, it's a little dippy do, it's $69,000 for <laughs> a master node. So put it in perspective um, and let that dictate your, but yeah, and back to the original question, the market cap, just this was expected. Um, you know, certainly just read up all of the stuff you can uh, that comes officially from VE chain and you will get these answers in advance. They also have a Discord server that is pretty good. I mean, it's a lot of weird stuff, but it's official. So they do keep a lot of the price and the moon boys out of there. Um, okay. Anything else? Uh, in this particular talk, maybe five, 10 minutes. Otherwise, we'll clip it here. Relating to losses, Noel, you're saying when Juan. Juan chain is supposed to come out any day. Um, here's the thing. As soon as coins get listed, I typically do not buy them, especially when they get listed on Binance. There's also an initial crash. It doesn't mean they won't go up, but just know that so you don't have to be necessarily the first in line. For those wondering what Wan Chain is, it's an interoperability coin. Um, had a nice ICO, and it is in the holy trinity of the interoperability coins. So pay attention to Wan, but don't be so. Everyone wants Wan. When everyone wants something, I usually don't go for it right away. You know what I mean? Like, just let, let's see what it does first. And, you know, I've been finding that a lot of these really obvious plays, like, let's look at ICX. I love ICX, right? Korean Ether. But we're mainnet launching the 31st, supposed to launch yesterday. Uh, who thought that on January 25th that we'd be looking at ICX 
um, you know, just a little bit higher than Venn in the $7 range, 69,000 Satoshis. Not a lot of people. People were expecting this maybe at 100,000. So just the obvious plays don't always be so, so sure they're obvious. One example that comes to mind is NXT, um, when there was going to be the Ignis airdrop. People were looking at these future prices on HitBTC with an incredibly small volume. These future prices were like $25 in Ignis. Oh, my God. You know, the tea leaves, it became pretty apparent that that airdrop wasn't as good as it was meant to be. It had run up from below two cents for NXT. And as soon as the airdrop happened, sure enough, we're looking at NXT as a fraction of what it was. I think the high was 13,000 Satoshis and Ignis. What's Ignis at today? Does anyone know? Anyone holding Ignis? Um, Ignis is at 47 cents. Makes sense relative to the the actual economics of it, but a lot of people were thinking they were going to get $20 Ignis. Insane. So just be aware, especially if it's coming from Reddit or other places, major places. If something looks like it's definitely going to happen, not saying it won't, just be aware that might not be that sure of a thing. Um, That applies to futures too. Okay. Anything else uh, that anyone would like to ask, ask it in the voice chat text. Robin, taking advantage is what you should be doing. Can you point me to a dictionary of terms? Yeah, I actually don't have a central resource from that, but if you hear or read a term that you don't understand at any point, just just ask and someone should be able to help you out. Um, you know, the, what spe- I'm sure there were a lot of terms that didn't make <laughs> sense from whale to falling daggers. Yeah, a lot. So whale, I'll, I'll break both of them down. So for whale, um, and Noel is mentioning Investopedia, which I know a lot of people like. So a whale is just someone, and if there are multiple, it would be a pod of whales. A whale is just a wealthy accumulator, someone who has a lot of funds to potentially get a lot of something. So let's say I had 100 Bitcoin and I wanted to go buy VE chain. And let's say I market bought 100 Bitcoin. Um, that would be not, <laughs> that would be a noticeable thing, number one, but I would be considered a whale. Falling dagger uh, basically means that when the price is dropping, if you think that there's value there, you can catch the knife as it's falling. So like if you picture this in real life, and rather than catching the blade of the knife where you would cut yourself, you catch it at the perfect place, which is the handle of the knife. So you've caught this useful and very dangerous thing, but now you can wield it appropriately and the price should go back up if you know what you're doing. So that's essentially what we're doing with then here, right? We're we're buying it at a... At, uh, as the price is falling because we want optimal entry points you know if we you know buy it and it keeps falling then we caught the blade so that's what falling knives are and yeah there's going to be a lot of jargon most of this stuff starts to get demist you know it'll make more sense after about a week or two you know most of these are trading terms that i guess i you know just picked up along the way sell walls all these other things but There's not a tremendous amount of stuff that you have to learn to get acclimated, but there's also another great resource that Chris just posted in here called CryptoMinded.com. It's a glossary of cryptocurrency terms. Okay. Uh, Anything else? If not, we'll wrap it up here. And I think this will probably be this week's last call. We'll try to get back to three next week, but maybe two. Um, That's it. One more question. Yeah, cool. All right, guys. I will see you in here later. I got Eli today, so I will not be as active. What you going to do? Maybe we'll watch Moana. That's fun. Or Hamilton. All right, guys. Bye-bye.